Dido and Beth were dragged along over the park, made to stand in awe as their guardians talked. The girls followed their stories and gesticulations as they pointed to the fields beneath, sloping like lawns down towards Kentish town into the valley of the Fleet River, past Fitzroy Farm and the marshes of Brookfield. I've been drawn to the park and the house at Kenwood, Hampstead Heath for years. You know, I live nearby and so walk here in the mornings and in the afternoons. And then I learnt about Dido Bell, the mixed race girl who lived here with Lord Mansfield, the owner of Kenwood House. And I became more and more intrigued about her story and the history of her enslaved mother, Maria Bell, which echoes quite a lot of the history of where I come from, Trinidad and the history of African enslavement. Isn't it an idyll, Dido's master said to his wife. But it can be improved, Lady Betty quickly added. Yes, it can. Dido Bell was the daughter of Maria Bell, an enslaved African woman, and John Lindsay, the seafaring nephew of Lord Mansfield. And Dido Bell was brought to live here, put here really, by her father. Lord and Lady Mansfield also had another child to look after, and that was Beth of the novel. All those things intrigued me with the story, but also, most importantly, Lord Mansfield, the Chief Justice of England, judged important cases to do with the slave trade and enslavement. So the whole family story as well as the political story come together in a very conflicted way. Beth and Dido followed and got to know each other, never fully understanding at first what was their actual relationship. But as they got older, they grew fond of each other in their play. How are we connected? Beth questioned. Connected? Related? Aren't we blood relatives? Our fathers are first cousins. That's close. Yes, but, but there's the problem of your mother. My mother? What about my mother? What about your mother? She was Polish. My mother was from Africa. That's the problem. Not, not the geography, but, but what? Well, in truth, we know very little about Dido Bell, the flesh and blood story. So I have to invent, and I go into the 18th century. It is the age of enlightenment, and yet the major powers are running the slave trade and enslavement. So I wanted to redress, I think, what is the popular story of Dido Bell, a rather romantic story, which we hear about through film and art and literature. I wanted the story to tell more than just about the past. I wanted it to address what I think is a pain which remains just below the surface of contemporary life. Welcome everyone. Um, my name is Polly Patello and I'm the publisher of Papier Press and of Dangerous Freedom by Lawrence Scott. Here, here it is, this um, beautiful cover, beautiful book. Um, as Lucy has said, um, you've just seen the first section of this lovely short film and the second section will come a little later. Um, I do feel it makes for a perfect introduction to the occasion. I'm so glad you can all join us for this event, whether it's morning, noon or night for you, wherever you are. Um, greetings from Dominica, I'm, which is where I am in the Eastern Caribbean um, and Happy Oak Crescent's Caribbean home. Here it's a um, glittering afternoon but I realise this is not a weather report, it's a book launch and we're here to celebrate um, Lawrence's powerful new historical novel. I will leave it to Lawrence to tell you more about how he has given voice to the story of Dido Bell. Um, and for people who don't know Lawrence, I just want to tell you a little bit about him. As he mentioned, he's from Trinidad, where he was born and raised, 
but now lives mainly in London. Over the years, um, his work, both fiction and non-fiction, has either won, been shortlisted or longlisted for a variety of international awards. So I'm really proud to be publishing Dangerous Freedom. Um, looking back, his first novel, Witch Broom, uh, has become a Caribbean classic. It was first published in 1992, became a BBC book at bedtime. 25 years later, I was very happy and to be able to republish the book. And also a French translation has just come out. Witch Broom was followed by Elrid Sin, then Night Calypso, and Light Falling on Bamboo, which is about the 19th century Trinidadian artist Michel Jean Casabon. And now it's Dangerous Freedom, which is set right at the beginning of the 19th century. Like everything that Lawrence writes, it probes beneath um, that unsettled surface of history of what we know about Dido and reveals in such a rich way something far more complex. This is a really radical and moving story and an important one. So uh, just to explain the order of play, um, Lawrence will now read from Dangerous Freedom. Then there will be the second section of the film. Lawrence will then be in conversation with Margaret Busby. I know people, many people know Margaret. She has such a long history of supporting many, many writers and many, many publishing endeavors, including Papio Press, which I'm very grateful in her capacity as publisher, writer, editor, critic. And last year when she was uh, chair of the judges for the Booker Prize. So it's great that she's here. I know you will enjoy this two-handed discussion with um, Lawrence and Margaret and of course at the end there will be your questions and comments. So first here is Lawrence to read from Dangerous Freedom. Thank you Lawrence. Hello everyone, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. And thank you for zooming in. I want to just quickly thank Lucy who introduced us all, who is keeping us all in the proper place. And I want to thank Karen Martinez and Andy Lambert who made the film that you've just been seeing part of. Karen is a Trinidadian filmmaker and Andy is a British filmmaker. And they wanted to gift this as a gift to the arts during COVID. So we want to thank them very much. I want to thank Polly for her introduction just now. And I want to thank her as my editor, the most brilliant editor I've really had, I think, in many ways. And Papillot Press, the invaluable small press based in the Caribbean and in the UK. I'm kind of proud of that, that it's based in both those places. This is my third book with uh, Papillot Press. And my book, as I say in my acknowledgements, my book breathes much more easily because of Polly. I have to thank her. She's a marvelous editor for all sorts of reasons. I need to thank my agent, Andrew Hewson. I think he's probably here tonight, of Johnson and Alcock. He's always there for me with humor, stories and encouragement and vital advice. I'm going to be talking with Margaret, so I'm gonna thank her again when I come to her. Throughout the time of preparing for this launch and also preparing for my book, and lots and lots of times, my dear friend, Eugene McConville, has been helping me with technical things. I am technically a little illiterate, I think. Um, and his photography, I have to thank him for too, when he's trying to make me look a bit decent. And of course, right here is Jenny Green, my partner. She's gonna kind of poke her head around the corner. Um, Jenny has sustained me throughout with her love and patience and insight. I must say she is my most critical, cr my cruelest critic. Um, I don't want you to make a fool of yourself, she always says to me. And then I have many, many others to thank, but I want, and they are my 
acknowledgements and thank you all people who are here. But I want to mention one person in particular, and that is my very good friend, Ruth Bromley, who died in the year in this year, a historian. She was my director at the college where I taught. And she heard about this book many times and was really interested in it. It's kind of local history for us in North London. And she introduced me to Gillian Tyndall's The Fields Beneath, which is about the landscape of North London. And so I want to remember Ruth at this point. Thank you. I'm going to read, first of all, from a short extract um, when Dido was a child and she is visiting her mother in Greenwich. She moves between her, the Lord Mansfield's house in Bloomsbury and her mother is living in Greenwich at the time. Dido child, yes, he make you a Christian. Right there in that beautiful church in St. George's Bloomsbury. So I know the house they take you to that morning on the square afterwards, that bleak late November day, 20th, 1766. It's so it stayed on the certificate. How I go forget all the family and you my black pickney lost among them in that paid for pew and me not at the front with the family. Your father allow me to be there to stand at the back and witness your forehead poured with water at the font and my name upon the document, Maria Bell, mother. You think that will save you? Baptism does not bestow freedom. You hear what I say? That's their law. Don't let him fool you. Like that other lie that because we breathing English air, we go be free. And you breathe sufficient, you're free. And look where we is in this secret place that your father must come at dark of night. Don't, don't dare bring the carriage down this lane, but walk furtively, looking behind him to visit his two niggers. He bring me so far for this, and you a prisoner in some big house. He show you any papers, any deed, manumission, they call it. You well know that. And you must put your hands on that piece of paper. Is not dressing up in these pretty clothes that will make you free. You must be your own self, free. Dress up in pretty clothes is easy. Easy that way to be a bell. Her mother's tongue was running all that day with rage. Yet there were rages, her father's too. She let that secret out. When he seemed not himself, he used her as his property and not his darling. Smitten by her beauty was how he spoke to his uncle and his aunt, but he might smite her blow on blow, as was his right, he said. She was his property. Dido thought of her mother as a soft person, but she could be so angry sometimes. She had not known all the promises her father had made to her mother, though she knew that he had said that he could not make her a lady, and yet she was his darling. The two did not seem to fit together, or did they? She heard him call her that again and again, darling. So where did that leave her? But once her mother had started with her rage, it was hard for her to stop, as she continued that afternoon, when her father had taken Dido from the house at Bloomsbury and brought her down river to Greenwich. The second episode, Dido is a lot older. She's about 22 and she is here in Kenwood House having a very, very important meeting with Lord Mansfield. Today, it was another matter. Their attention was on the document in his hand. This is my will and last testament. And here there are some words pertaining to you, Dido. There are some more, but it's not those others that I wish to bring to your notice this morning. Time will be sufficient for that. Yes, master. You learn of those in good time, but these few are the ones which I would like you to read out to me now. His slender fingers, with still a relic of their youth in their slenderness, 
but crabbed with the arthritis of age, pointed to the lines he wished her to read as his blotched hands handed her the document to hold upon the lectern of her knee. Dido had to lean into the page to decipher the spider's scroll of ink across those documents. There was so much that she learned in those eight words. She looked up to him with a request for permission, as it were, to continue, for her eye had perused the sentence in one go before she came to enunciate it for him. Dido read, quoting what was there written, I confirm to Dido Elizabeth Bell her freedom. Her thought was that he should have read it out loud to her himself, but that thought was overtaken by both the weight of that these eight words carried, and yet also how ordinary and concise they were. And then the thought that it should have taken so long for them to be said, 22 years to be written and to be legally so written. She felt for a moment the urge to let her tears fall, but instead, kept control where she felt them welling and blurring her vision. Had she ever known absolutely that she was not free before this moment? Had she been a slave for 22 years? When would this knowledge he proclaimed publicly so that all would know that she was free now, in case it was ever mistaken? Was it to be here enshrined, just that? Or was it only to be at his death? Was it only then that he would release her? She wondered and wondered whether to ask. Was he offering her a sight of the reward to come, but saying at the same time, he must keep her to himself, his Dido, till his death? For it was a will upon which the words were written, not what her mother called papers. Manumission. Dido was angry inside. She was torn this way and that. How did he come to have her freedom, she thought, so that it was in his power to give it, or should she say, return it to her? When had he acquired it? The thought passed through her mind whether her father had sold her to him. Was there a bill of sale filed somewhere? She, property, some document where she was linked to her mother, she a slave, therefore Dido also enslaved. She was confused as to what to say. She did not wish to say, thank you. She kept her silence and felt all the time that that was the proper thing to do. Her gratefulness lay elsewhere in the intricate and the complex history of her emotions which were there since she had come to live in his house as neither fish nor fowl nor good red herring as Hal on the farm had been accustomed to tease her and then to insult her. Her master looked at her gravely. She kept her eyes mostly lowered apart from some intermittent glimpses. She allowed herself as he took the document from her hands and rolled away the contents from her view. It was not as if she was asked to put a signature to it, to agree. It was not that kind of document. She wondered why this was happening at this precise moment, in this year and not before. And then her master spoke, seeing the many questions of doubt and anxiety playing upon her face. You must not worry yourself about this just now, Dido. He smiled then. He remembered, she remembered how he smiled, like those smiles hardly breaking from his lips, but playing there as in his portraits. He always seemed another self, beyond the self in the moment. He then went further to promise her a portrait of himself, which was in the keeping of Lady Betty's intimate friend, the Dowager Duchess of Portland. There were so many portraits of him, this one by Van Loo. I wish to have you hang it in your room, Dido dear, to put you in mind of me when I'm not here, one that has known you since your infancy and whom you've honored 
with your uninterrupted confidence and friendship. Dido listened without interrupting, for she did not want to ask, must I not worry? Then she asked, must I not expect? Then she stumbled. Then she caught herself and repeated, must I not expect my freedom now? She had hesitated because of this gift of the portrait, which was bequeathed to her. She could see that he wished her to say something, to be grateful for the gift, at least. Too much was happening in that moment, happening and yet, and not happening, but told that it would happen. What was her present state to be? And him honored by her uninterrupted confidence and friendship. These words were spoken surely to both silence any revolt within her breast and to woo her to him for her life's duration, keep her as his property, his slave, till his death. He seemed to grow taller and taller, and her looking up to him made it difficult to hear or to be heard, and as if guessing her tortured self-questioning, he said, Freedom, Dido? To do what? Where, where would you go? She kept looking at him steadily, in a way she had not done before. She could feel she was retreating. She sensed that he saw that retreat. Indeed, what was this freedom for? And besides, she, a woman. What was a woman's freedom? I will protect you, Dido. You cannot be taken. You must stay here. Here is your freedom. But I repeat, you cannot be taken. You are free. You are legally free. It is here written. Any capture or transportation would easily be contested in a court of law on the producing of this document that I have shown you. That possible capture that was mentioned so explicitly and the scene of transportation imagined shocked and terrified Daidu. Her master seemed uncertain at that point about the assurance he was giving her. He let the scroll fall from his hands, the entire last will and testament reaching the ground, written with his wealth. As he spoke, he pointed and continued to indicate the words written there, which confirmed her freedom. I have seen to it, he said. My judgment has made it plain that no one can be captured and put in irons to be returned to the colonies. But this above all, this statement relating to your particular freedom goes even beyond that judgment, rest assured. Had he protested too much, Dido thought. Will I not go to my mother? Dido felt suddenly emboldened to ask your mother. That was the promise a long while back, but not kept. How can you think of leaving me, Dido, after all these years? He knew her conflict and how to silence any thought she might have of running away from him. Was that what he thought? You ran away once, he said ominously. Then he smiled. You were a girl then. Dido did not reply, abruptly reminded of her skirt, caught in brambles on the meadow at Brookfield, and the awful memory of Hal marching her back to the kitchen door. My mother, why have I not heard from her for all these years? Just one letter, no more. She felt her voice crack. That was for the best, Dido, was it not? She promised to send for me. As I say, it was for the best. You must know that. Let us finish with this business now. She felt it was a verdict and a judgment. She felt that she might lose control. She did not want him to see her cry. Not at this moment. She rose to leave and manage a smile and a curtsy. Come, come, Dido, none of that. 
he put out his hand to raise her from her knees. He was always so charming, so eloquent. Thank you. Before we continue with the film, um, in the UK, I just want to say that in the UK today, right now, actually, um, yes, actually on the moment, it's now eight o'clock here in London, people are going outside to remember the 126,000 people who have died during COVID and are remembering them and their relatives. And we wanted to mention that in the middle of the launch. Some of you may have wondered what you were going to do. And so we are just remembering that at this moment. And now we're going to have the second part of the film. Thank you. We have, for instance, the famous portrait of Dido, a very conflicted portrait by David Martin of Beth and herself. And I wanted to look at that again. And that portrait suggests not a happy story for me. As Dido stood there staring at the portrait, she began to understand the artifice. Who was she? Dido frowned. Who was this turbaned, bejeweled, bare-chested, dusky, tawny woman being ushered forward by Lady Elizabeth Murray's gentle, coaxing hand? When did she or her mother ever look like that? Was this David Martin's Dido, Queen of Carthage? Was she being ridiculed, subtly? Was she being egged on, as it were, to rise from her seat in haste? Lady Elizabeth, Beth, could caution without looking. Her gaze was straight ahead. Not like this charade that was her, in flight, as it were, pointing in a silly way to her face. Dido was furious at the outcome and felt helpless as to what she should do about it. The world of my novel begins with Dido Bell, who is now Elizabeth Gavigne, her married name, and she lives with her husband, John, and her three sons in Pimlico. She is very worried about the capture of her children, and she is still yearning for her mother, whom she still hasn't heard from for 28 years. Elizabeth's father had brought her mother and herself to another climate and geography. She eventually fell in love with London, but she continued to dream if she might ever return to where she had come from, ever see her mother again. Some people asked her why she had fallen in love with this place. She had no simple answer. Here she was Elizabeth d'Avigny, Lizzie. She relished her names. She was no longer Dido. I'm going to be talking with Margaret now, at last. Hi, Hi Margaret. Hi, Laura. And I'm just going to thank Margaret, because Polly thanked Margaret, but I have known Margaret since 1981, and Margaret is known by so many people, and, uh, but I've known her for a long while. And she's, as she said to Polly and I, I'm going to do this because you're old pals. <laughs> and that's true. But I'm sure she will be challenging nonetheless, and she will talk with me about dangerous freedom. It's lovely to be here with Margaret. Thanks, Lawrence. It's, it's lovely to be here with you and, and Polly. I admire you both. And as you say, we go back a long way, Lawrence. And I remember when I bridged Witch Broom, your first novel for Radio 4, with, yeah. um, produced by Marina Solandi Brown. So there's a little chinny connection there. <laughs> Yeah, just can I just say as well, Margaret, you are the founder of Alison and Busby, 
who published my first two novels. You weren't there at the time. No. As <laughs> you were a guardian angel, I think we used to call you. You'd be always coming into the office and helping Peter Day and David Shelley. Um, so you were there. You were like as if you had published. Now, actually, you had such a hand in Witch Broom and Ail Ritson. So there you go. <laughs> Well, thanks for all those nice words, but I, I would just like to follow on up those wonderful words that um, Marina, for example, said when she talked about dangerous freedom reveals how powerfully an act of fictive empathy can dispel long shadows of historical forgetfulness. Now, first of all, why did you decide at this point in your literary career that this was the novel that you wanted to write? Oh, my God. Well, that's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> it's a big, long story. And Jenny's already told me many times, no long, long stories. So I'm going to try and keep it to the essentials. The story has been with me a very long time. Actually, it first emerges in a long poem of mine called English Heritage in 1995, um, where there is a face at the window, and it's Dido Bell's face. Um, in 1995, I was re um, researching Aylred Sin. And that is a story that is set in a, a great house, as, like, as Kenwood is a great house, and also has to do very, very centrally with a portrait. And I became very interested in 18th century portraiture of black personages. Um, and so that's one reason for going towards this story. I discovered more about Kenwood and I discovered the portrait. Um, and I learned through my research more about this portraiture of mostly what you see in the 18th century of black servants or enslaved little boys and girls in a fawning position looking up at great um, figures. There's one of these in Kenwood itself, I think by Van Dyck. Um, so I became very interested in the portrait, in the story of Dido Bell, this mixed race girl, you know, and I saw it was a Caribbean woman actually. Mm. Uh, a Caribbean African woman, African Caribbean woman. And I am not African, but I'm Caribbean. Um, and there were great echoes for me of coming to England myself in a different kind of way and living, living in a great house and finding it very strange. And people constantly asking me about my tan. They would keep saying, are you going to lose your tan soon? And what the temperature was at home? And why did you speak with such a funny voice? So I felt that this girl in Kenwood would have a lot of awkwardnesses. But the big thing, I suppose, and what I think Marina is saying mm -hmm. with fictive empathy, a wonderful way of describing what I think a novelist is trying to do, or certainly I am trying to do, is to enter again, to enter the character of Daidu and to give her a voice. Everybody around her in the history has a voice. Mansfield, Lady Mansfield. History has a voice, but Daidu doesn't speak. You wrote a play called African Cargo, and I think you That's do right. yeah. speak there. Well, she was a character in that play, but again, it's it's a question of how how did you negotiate that thing of having historical fact and fiction? How was that a a massive thing to, rather than just drawing on totally fictional characters, you, you went to historical characters and turned them into fiction. Yes. Um, and I wanted to enter all of them because I, there, there are no, I would put it this way, there are no monsters in the people that I think, some people might think are the baddies, as you heard from me, the way she relates to Mansfield. Um, you know, it's very, very conflicted relationship of affection and also of that she is his slave or had been his slave, enslaved legally. Um, what I can say is that I think it just happens and has happened in all my books, actually, that I want to return to a site. There's an essay actually by Toni Morrison called The Site of Memory. And I think she taught memory there is, yes, your own memories, but history as memory. To return there and find all the pieces that, um, that are there, it's like an excavation. She has, I've just been reminded of this by a student's essay in his bibliography, The Site of Memory. And she, Morrison has this wonderful 
phrase, literary archaeology, that you're trying to find out what you can use to give voice, not just to the character who is drawing you specially, but to all the others. And I do use things from history, but I also have to invent and I have to imagine. And that has to come from inside of me, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I think for, as a Trinidadian, I, I bring a lot to an understanding of the Dido character, but also into the relationship, the colonial relationship that she has with these people around her. Um, I mean, I, I lived in the great house in Trinidad, but I was very friendly with the black women who worked for my mother in that house. So I learned a lot. I have to bring everything. You bring everything and then it has to be sorted out. So that's part of the way I think that I'm dealing with history, but also with, with invention and imagination. Mm. As Morrison again says, you have to use. Um, yeah, I think that. And also, yeah, I think that for the moment, yeah. Did you find resonances with contemporary events? Was, was, was there some connection you found between what was happening in the 18th and 19th, 17th and 18th and 19th centuries, if you like, and what's happening in the 21st century in terms of the way Black people have been treated, are being treated, or the resonances of colonialism? How did that impact on your writing? Well, you know, this book was researched about four or five years ago. It's been ready about two years waiting to come out. <laughs> um, and it should have been out last year. And then it would have been come out in the midst of Black Lives Matter, for instance. And I was very glad in a way that it didn't come out then in the end. Um, I'm not sure as a white writer, I would want to be trying to peddle a book in Black Lives Matter of this kind, because I do think the book reaches some of what's been going on and what's been going on and reaches the book. Um, but what I would say is that curiously, so the book was not written to go to any of that in an explicit way, but of course the problem has always been there. <laughs> Black Lives Matter has raised problems that have always been there for centuries. Um, but what I found was that, you know, like hearing the mother in some of the readings I just did, where the mother says to Dido, papers, you must find the papers, man, you mm -hmm. At that time, the Windrush um, crisis broke. And this whole question of papers and not having papers and not having the right papers and being told you don't belong because you don't have the papers, that whole dreadful episode, I thought, well, I haven't written the book to address that, but God, does it not echo? It rarely echoes. Mm. And I think that's what I, is, as I say, that, you know, there is this pain stretching way back, you know, just beneath the surface, and maybe not just beneath the surface, erupting over the surface um, right now in America, here, and elsewhere. On the football field, there's a most remarkable um, article in The Guardian today about a journalist, a football, I don't read the sports pages very often, but I read this compulsively about the racism on the football pages today. You know, um, mm. very moving story by a young journalist, yeah. What did you find the most difficult part of this book in terms of constructing it, if you like? Because it's, it, it moves quite off quite a lot between the younger woman and the, the older character. Was that a challenge in, in trying to identify with, with both of those versions of Dido and Elizabeth? Yeah, it was a big challenge and it didn't always work at first. And it's where people like Polly come in. Okay. And I would thank here actually, somebody I would definitely thank is Alan Marr, who of the wonderful Tyndall Street Press, who published my previous novel and who works for the literary agency, but he worked for me. I sent him my manuscript very early on, long before I showed it to Polly. And he turned me round actually, because my book was written in the first person. It's now written in the third. It was written in the present tense. It had a lot of scaffolding about moving between one time and another and so on. 
And one of the things Alan said to me was, you know, Lawrence, you've got an extraordinary story here and you just need to tell it plain. You don't need a lot of dressing up, a lot of introduction of this, a lot of introduction of that. People, once they get reading, they will trust you and they will move from the past into the present and vice versa. That was easier said than done. And, um, but I did follow that advice and then still after readers, some readers and Jenny, of course, constantly um, saying this doesn't work, um, Polly got her hands on it. And Polly and I worked beautifully. She worked with me on my stories. She even had little things still with witch broom to change, I think. And um, we, we got it to, to move. And the, the feeling I always said after Polly is that the book began to breathe easily. It didn't feel cumbersome to move, move on, you know? Um, it was a challenge, yeah, it was a challenge. Mm. What do you hope that readers will take away from the story? What I want them to take away from the story is that periods of history, this is something also which is happening a lot now, we are having to redress, address things and redress them um, in the sense of and de-romanticize things. I think the Dido Bell, because of the portrait, because of, I think, mistaken um, views about Mansfield's position historically in regard to abolition and emancipation and so on, there's a romantic story. Some of that is in Bell. I actually loved Bell, the film, in many ways, but it wasn't my story. It tells another kind of story. It tells the thing about marriage, for instance, in the book, which very well done. Um, but I wanted people to hear Dido's voice, an ordinary woman who now lived in Pimlico. She has three children. She isn't very well. And she, she's been traumatized, this woman. She's been a five-year-old on a naval ship in the Caribbean, up and down the islands with her enslaved mother, or well, not maybe always enslaved, and her father, a naval, Scottish naval officer. And, um, she, you know, she can't just be a black aristocrat and sort of sail off into history. Um, she is, she's a complex person and we don't have her voice. And you know, the wonderful cover that Andy Dark has um, designed with an echo of Phyllis Wheatley on it, mm. which we um, acknowledge at the back, Phyllis Wheatley, the first African-American black poet. And Mar Margaret, you know, you have your wonderful anthologies of um, Daughters of Africa and Phyllis is there at the front of the first edition um, and I use that for your first edition is acknowledged in the back of my book. Um, I wanted that more to be the kind of portrait of Dido. She's a writer. She was, she was um, Mansfield's um, amanuensis. She took dictation. She was educated. You know, in the portrait, it's Elizabeth Murray who has the book on her lap. And Dido has that bowl of fruit and vegetables and things, the bounty of the empire, which all those portraits have, you know, of enslaved boys and girls, they're all offering fruit and bounty to their masters. Dido is still carrying it. I think David Martin, the artist, had some radical ideas, but I still don't quite know what they are. But they're not ideas that I think one should just be, accept. I think the portrait needs a lot more, um, Mm. sort of inquiry. So I want people to see Dido as a more complex person, to hear her voice, see her with her children and her husband in her home, a modest home, as the beginning of the book says. Yes, I think that's what I want. A more mm. modest, an ordinary woman, in a sense, that she wants to become, I think, yeah. And a very intelligent one. It's interesting you mentioned for this weekly because I was at a Zoom event yesterday, um, <laughs> with Ade Sholanke, who's done a play about for this weekly, and the fact that she was, yes, she was the first African-American to publish a book 
for poetry, but she, she was in London in 1773. Absolutely, yeah. So it's, it's interesting that you have these two extraordinary women um, who were actually on the streets of London. Yes. Not many people know that. But Margaret, uh, can I... Um, because, you know, I would have loved to have had her in my novel. And, you know, <laughs> the trouble is that when you're writing a novel, you can't have everybody in. And people then say, oh, that sounds very clunky. You're just bringing that in because you've did a bit of research, you know. So it didn't feel right to actually have her meet Phyllis. I mean, I have a meeting allowed at Equiano, <laughs> but I think it would have been a bit much probably. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, the, you, there are so, so many wonderful things in this book. I, mean, I also like the fact that you deal with that sort of colorism thing, the fact that she has twin sons who are yes. of different colors. And it's, yes. it's quite a contemporary take on, on all of that as well. Yes. Um, Margaret, Margaret and Lawrence, I'm really sorry to interrupt, but this is your, this is your two minute last question warning <laughs> from me. <laughs> Yeah, I don't want to take us all the time. Sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. You got something to say? But no. I would, yes, I, I like that moment, Margaret, because of the midwives who are astonished at these children. This yes. boy and this more fairer son. And then it's almost white child, the third child. Yes. What else did you want to say last, Margaret? Well, I, I, I think that it, it's just that you capture so many different aspects, which are historical and political, if you like, in terms of issues that we're still dealing with. And I, I'm sure there are lots of other questions that people will put. So I, I'll, I'll leave it at that and just say thank you for a wonderful book and beautiful novel. And it must have been a joy to, to get to the end of it. But it was a really well-crafted novel. I know that everybody will also enjoy reading. So thank, thank you. Thank you so much, Margaret. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you both. Uh, again, absolutely fascinating. I, 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 I'm the lucky one who gets to be able to see, say that, but I can see lots of virtual clapping going on and later we'll have a chance for some, for some real clapping. But I'm popping up just for a moment um, because we've reached the time for, for questions from, from, from everybody who's here. Um, we've got about 10 minutes for questions and so I'm just going to explain how we're going to do it. There's sort of two options that you've got. If you want to, you can write your question in chat. It would be really helpful if you put a string of question marks at the beginning of your question, because obviously there's lots of comments and congratulations and things going through the chat as well. And then I will read them out to Lawrence. But it would also be really lovely if some people would ask the question live. Um, if you would be up for doing that, you can raise your virtual hand from your Zoom toolbar. Um, in a moment, I'm going to give people the right to unmute yourself. Um, so if you've got a question to ask, you've put up your hand, I call out your name, then unmute yourself and you'll be able to ask Lawrence your question um, live. But you may want to just ask it in chat. And if that's the case, that's absolutely fine. And we can, we can read that out. Um, let me just give you the right so that you can unmute yourself if you want to, um, once you're asked. So do we have any questions for Lawrence? Let me get Lawrence spotlighted again so that if you're on speaker view, it's Lawrence that you see. You can say things as well. <laughs> Some, some lots of comments you're going to enjoy reading afterwards, Lawrence, that have been sort of feeding through chat during the reading and your conversation with, with Margaret. There's somebody called Hilda. Oh, here's, hang on, here's Christine would like to um, ask a question. So can you unmute yourself, um, Christine, and, and ask your question to Lawrence? Yes. Um, yeah, okay, I'm with you. <laughs> Hi, Christine. Christine uh, from Liège. Based from uh, some blackness. Uh, yeah. Ask a question. Can I say something? Can yeah. I say you are the translator of Witch Broom into French? Balai de Sorcière. Christine, yes. And this is launched just now as well. Christine, nice to see you. 
It's yeah, well, it's it's so nice to be here, and uh, I, I just managed to finish reading Dangerous Freedom, and uh, it's a fascinating work, really, and uh, I, I fully agree with what all that uh, has been said so far. Um, I had um, I, ha I had two really uh, trivial questions. One is, um, why do you change the name of Kenwood House? Why does it become Kane? And uh, and the other one is, were you already thinking of? I think we were actually. You, you may remember when we 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 met at Kenwood House Cafe, and uh, in with with my mother Annette, and uh, that was in the 1990s. And uh, <laughs> and you talked to us about the the history of the place. Uh, so was the story already in your mind on your mind at the time? I, from what you've just said, I think it was. Yes, but it was in my mind when I was researching Aylred Sin, because I was going into looking at great houses and um, the presence of African people in those houses. As you remember, in in Aylred Sin, there's a portrait of. A uh, duke and a slave child, and there's also the Jordan and um, narrative in Aylward Sin. Um, I see your colleague here, Bastian Bowman, is here. He will know all about that. He can probably tell you. Uh, I'm sure you remember it anyway. Um, so yes, I was already researching great houses. What's an interesting thing is great houses in England now have to be bring to the surface these stories, these histories, um, you know, the presence has to come. So I was already looking for that at Kenwood and fascinated. I think I, I said that, I think. Now about Kenwood, Kenwood was its name at the very beginning um, and it changed to Kenwood very early, but in an effort almost, I suppose, maybe I don't do it, but in an effort to kind of push the place a little into fiction, away from literally Kenwood. You see, Kenwood, we all know, we go there for a coffee, a walk. We're all, people of North London know Kenwood. And I kind of wanted to get away from that Kenwood. And so I used Kenwood, yeah. But the neighboring um, Highgate School has Kenwood on its notice board there, you can see. And the property next door to Kenwood is also called Kenwood, yeah. Okay, we've got a lovely lot of questions coming through chat. So Lawrence, Barbara and Adam ask, are there any historical writers who you particularly admire that were models, inspirations for you? Right, I was saying in an interview just yesterday to the Literature Week at University of the West Indies that I don't consider myself an historical writer. I'm really writing historical novels actually. I write novels inspired by history. I go back to places to do something with history. Um, I think that's a better way. So, and I think that's again, to quote Toni Morrison, that's the thing. I'm trying to get at truths which are a bit beyond what historical novels sometimes do. Um, and so, and I play quite, uh, not entirely, just any way I like, but with dates and things and places and figures of people. But I'm not writing a historical novel, I don't think. I'm writing a novel inspired by a historical situation. So in answer to the question to Barbara and Adam, um, I'm not so good at reading historical novels, but the novel that I think for this kind of writing and I think for approaching this, the subject of this book would be Toni Morrison's Beloved. I don't see anyone who can approach this sort of material and not have Morrison's Beloved right behind you. There are other books, you know, I was saying to students today, there's a history book. We were talking about novels and history and fiction and history. And C.L.R. James's The Black Jacobins about the, the Haitian Revolution reads like a novel, actually. Um, so maybe that's another historical book um, that influences me and is there. But I have to find my own way, you know. Barbara knows this well. She gave the first introduction to Witchbroom in our school library. 
you know, it's a quirky book. It's not a normal kind of history. If I don't write history, really, in the usual way, I don't think. This question sort of picks up on this, Lawrence, actually, from Andre, who asks, can you describe the process of research for this book, having already mentioned the germ of it coming to you in 1995? Right, so there was that beginning. Is this Andre Bagu? Yes? It is. Yeah. Hi, Andre. Um, hello, hello. Everybody's coming in. Um, thank you very much. Um, well, I did a lot of stuff that you have to do. One, one exciting thing I did was I got hold of papers from Schoon Palace in Scotland. Schoon Palace is where the original portrait of Dido and Elizabeth Murray is, the very original. There's only a copy at Kenwood House. And I was able to go through all the Mansfield papers and choose what I thought would be the most relevant. I had to pay for this, paid 80 pounds. Um, and then the papers were sent to Dundee University. And I went up to Dundee and spent a few days and researched my papers that were given to me. Very exciting. All these bundles tied with pink ribbon. Um, and one of the things I got out of that process was the refurbishment of Kenwood when the Mansfields buy Kenwood and refurbish it with all the decoration that we see in it now. And I tell you, some of these manuscripts and letters and bills for glass and upholstery and stuff, all that was very exciting. And there is a part of the book where Dido and Beth are going around the house with um, Lady Betty, Mansfield's wife. Um, and that part of the research helped me. I hope it doesn't, I hope it's not too clunky. Actually, somebody told me it was really good. A volunteer at Kenwood House said it was really good the way I used the decoration of the house. But I know that from going to the house, but also this research at Schoon Palace. Yeah, there are other examples like that, but that was very exciting. Okay, there's, there's quite a few people interested in this includes Caitlin and Marina who are interested to know if, if you know anything um, of what became of her offspring or if any of Dido's descendants are aware of your book or whether you tried to contact anybody. There's a little cluster of questions around that sort of thing. Okay, in 2008, there was a remarkable um, exhibition at Kenwood House. I was in Trinidad at the time, researching and writing Light Falling on Bamboo, so I missed it. But when I came back to England, the, the curator at Kenwood let me have all the notes um, and resources of that exhibition. It was an exhibition about the legacy of enslavement and justice and things like this. Um, and actually, I, I lost my way slightly. Just, um, what, what was the question? So this was about uh, Dido's descendants, whether, yeah. oh, that, now, that sort of thing. One of the people they employed for that was a, a genea genealogist from the BBC. And she discovered uh, a number of things, for instance, um, about Dido's um, or Elizabeth Davinier's children. Um, I didn't go into their adult life because I wasn't really dealing with it, but one of them settled in South Africa, the other one in London. Her third child dies in infancy. I have him, well, I won't say what, how I have him, um, but I leave that for you to discover. Um, I, but I would say here at this point, there's a big spoiler in this book, and please nobody tell anybody about it when you're reading it and passing it on to other people. Otherwise, it will spoil the reading. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, well, well, that's a perfect ending, really. What there's one question in chat which other people in chat have sort of answered, um, asking, "Is it going to be for sale at Kenwood House?" And there's lots of people think yes, it should be for sale at Kenwood House. But until it is, I've put into chat um, some of the places that you can actually buy dangerous freedom. Thank you, Lawrence. Um, Thank we're you. Sort of, we're pleasure. sort of getting to the end of our time now. So I'm just going to um, do the thing of asking you all to unmute so that you can um, show your appreciation and your congratulations, to Lawrence, in the usual way. Oh my god. Sorry, friend. Oh 
<laughs> okay, I'm going to I'm going to mute you all again, but you will have the um, right to unmute yourself because I'm on the phone. It does it does bring us to sort of the the chaos of Zoom, which is rather which is rather lovely, but uh, nonetheless. Um, okay, I'm going to now hand back over to Polly. Yes, gosh, well, thank you all for coming. Um, it's been such a, a really warm and stimulating occasion, <coughs> as um, these Zoom launches tend to be, always are really. They have a certain charm, I think. Um, Margaret, thank you so much. Um, thanks everybody. I know the questions and comments and participation um, could have gone on for a long time, but I hope everybody got a good flavor of, about this wonderful book. Um, I just want to thank again Andy Dark, who's been the creative designer for all Papillot Press books. Lucy, you've done a great job um, keeping us all organized technically and holding our hands and all that. And of course, Lawrence, most of all, thanks to you. Massive thanks for your book and you and your considered wisdom and skill as a writer. It's really fantastic. And perhaps we should remember also all those Dido Bells whose stories remain hidden from history. So, um... Daughters the, of Africa, they are, Polly. Sorry? I say they are Daughters of Africa. <laughs> That's indeed, indeed, of course. Um, so please buy the book. Um, you can look at the website, papiotpress.co.uk for more information. So we've reached really the end. People who would like to go and have another glass of something, please do that. And other people may want to mingle and stay a little while. But basically, goodbye and thank you for, to you all. Thanks. Lovely. Thank you, Polly. Thanks very much to you. Can't thank you enough. Thank you.